15 years ago, a group of college roommates sat around their living room, just savoring the time of life and the richness of their friendship. And they asked this question, wouldn't it be great if we could just do this for the rest of our lives? <laughs> At the time, this probably looked something like this, <laughs> or maybe like this, hopefully not too much like this, <laughs> and finally this. But this was more than just fond memories with good friends. This was the life on life that happens when you cram a bunch of guys into a house for three years. This was fostering community. This was caring about justice in that totally zealous and radical and completely anarchist way that only college kids can. This was having a shared sense of purpose about who we were and how we were gonna change the world or at least our little corner of it. But the weeks that followed graduation scattered us all over that world. Literally, we were covering three different continents. And, you know, just like that, this, any semblance of this day in, day out, shared experience of life that we had for the last four years in college was gone. You know, we'd reconnect every year, which was great, but over time, inevitably, conversations about Friends and neighbors we didn't know or neighborhoods we'd only seen pictures of, they, they served to remind us of this growing distance in our relationships. But we wanted reconnection. And so that question that we had asked so many years ago in our living room resurfaced, this time with a little more maturity and a little more meaning. Wouldn't it be great if we could just do this for the rest of our lives? But this now meant being in each other's lives again, raising our families together, engaging issues of racial and socioeconomic injustice, and perhaps even moving into an impoverished neighborhood where we could help rebuild community together. And this was really exciting. It reignited that sense of purpose that had waned from our college years. But there was a big problem. We were all married, we were all that wasn't the problem. <laughs> we were all married and we were living in different cities and we were all pursuing different jobs and different grad schools and different residency programs. And we pretty quickly realized that if this was gonna happen, we were all gonna have to give up something. You know, for me personally, this challenged one of the central tenets that I'd been raised with as the son of Indian immigrants who were pursuing the American dream, independence. Independence meant that I was going to pursue that best school or that best job or that best opportunity to make the most money so that I could make a name for myself in this world. But instead, here I was contemplating making this major life decision because I missed my college buddies. Who was I kidding? Clearly not my parents because they thought it was a terrible idea. And it took everything in me as a moderately respectful Indian son to push back and to say, you know what, this vision is worth fighting for. And so over that next year, eight of us moved into the neighborhood of North Churchill here in Richmond, into houses within a two block radius of each other. And at the time, that neighborhood had all of the markings of a blighted inner city community, boarded up houses, trash littering the streets, corner stores on what seemed like every block, and this recurrent pop, pop that made you think the neighborhood was celebrating the 4th of July every week. For this group of friends, this idea of committing to each other and moving into this neighborhood together was more than just rejecting a societal push towards independence. It was choosing to run the other direction and embrace dependence. Though at the time, we really didn't know how that was gonna play out for us. You know, our neighborhood, despite uh, you know, all of its shortcomings was actually this really charming place. Um, we had this warm culture of porch sitting, you know, bustling streets with people walking back and forth from the corner stores to the bus stops. And most strikingly, people who actually talked to each other. People who spent time together and knew each other's lives and their histories and their business. You know, my wife and I remarked in the first month of living there, we had had more conversations with neighbors 
than we had had in the previous three years from the suburban community we'd moved from. And I remember thinking in that first couple of weeks that there were more neighbors who knew my business than I was frankly comfortable with. <laughs> in those early years, our group of friends had to depend on each other in some very practical ways. I'll give you an example. Um, Corey and Sarah Widmer were our friends who were moving down from New Jersey. And the plan was that they were going to move in with my wife and I for a few months while they scoped out the neighborhood and found a home uh, that they would want to move into. But the problem was, at the time, the neighborhood didn't have uh, a lot of move-in ready homes. And so they moved in, or they moved in with us and lived, uh, looked around for a few months um, and finally ended up buying a place that was going to require some significant renovations. Um, the catch was that Sarah, by this point, was eight months pregnant. And as the first uh, family in our group of friends that had, had moved into that stage of life, none of us really knew what kind of challenges that was going to present for us. Uh, and so a group of friends, this group of friends got together one night and we started to workshop. What are we going to do about this? What's this going to look like? How are we going to fix this situation? And uh, the solution we came up with, one couple, the Widjays, decided that they were going to give the Widmers their house. The Widjays... We're going to give the Widmers their friggin' house. <laughs> As in, the Widjays would move out, the Widmers would move in, have their baby, stay there until the renovation was done, and that's what happened. In those next few weeks, the Widjays moved into our house, the Widmers moved into the Widjays' vacated house. And the thing I remember most about this was our amazing mailman, Daryl, who somehow was able to get the right mail to the right people in the right place. <laughs> An interesting thing happened over the next couple of years. Um, you know, these relationships of depth and dependence started to extend beyond just that close circle of friends. My two-year-old daughter's best friend is a 300-pound black man named Reggie <laughs> who lives next door. Most days, Reggie loves my kids more than I do, <laughs> especially my daughter, Abby, and she loves him too. And, you know, she has her favorite stuffed animal is this little white teddy bear that uh, Reggie gave her for Valentine's Day last year. She won't go to bed without it. She calls it Reggie Bear. <laughs> now, Reggie is almost 70, and he's not in the best of health. And on a couple of occasions in these rare glimpses of emotion that he shows, he has told me that my kids are the reason that he gets out of bed every day. And that's really amazing. But the truth is that Reggie has become incredibly important to us as well. He's become a part of our extended family as he keeps an eye on our kids as they're playing out on the sidewalk. Or he scolds them when they start to get out of line. And our relationship with Reggie was just one example of what many of us who had moved into this neighborhood had started to experience. All of us were finding that we were becoming more and more woven into the fabric of our community. Neighbors would knock on my door at 7 in the morning just to remind me that I had to move my car for the street cleaners. On a few occasions when I had just been so harried by life and work and having too many babies and let my lawn get out of control, my neighbors have mowed it without even asking. When my wife pulls up from the grocery store with our four little kids in tow, they jump quickly to lend a hand. That good neighboring felt really uncomfortable to me. You know, I'd grown up in this middle-class suburbia, and we didn't do that in the suburbs. Um, you know, it was uncomfortable because my culture was one of independence. Relying on other people was a, was a sign of weakness. And it was uncomfortable also because every time that my neighbors did something for me, it highlighted my inability to manage my own life. But what happened, what happened from there was that we moved from you know, this feeling of uncomfort to the realization that every time I let myself be helped, I was pushing past just surface level relationships with my neighbors. And that was powerful. And so over time, we learned to let ourselves be helped. And in that, we found authentic, mutual, and beautiful relationships with our neighbors. Now, the irony of where I learned these profound life lessons wasn't lost on me. You know, we had moved into this impoverished neighborhood to be good neighbors and to try to help people. But we realized quickly that we didn't know how to do that. You know, and it was these neighbors 
who we thought we were coming to help that taught us how to help. Ultimately, I recognized my need for people here. Yes, my daily needs where they would come and help with these things just to stay on top of my crazy life. But more importantly, I learned that I couldn't do it on my own. I learned that dependence isn't a dirty word. So I want to clarify something. Uh, you know, I get that this moving into this inner city social justice stuff may freak some people out. Probably not in this room, but it certainly freaked my parents out. Um, you know, I, my parents instilled me with a lot of really great and wonderful, beautiful values that I'm so thankful for. But I remember telling my dad about this idea so many years ago, and he, he just couldn't understand it, couldn't wrap his brain out of it. And he looked at me with these wide eyes and he said, what? I worked my ass off to get out of poverty and now you want to move back into it? <laughs> so I, I get that this is not for everybody. But I have come to believe that these concepts of dependence have become, are, are relevant to all of us, no matter what kind of neighborhood we live in. You know, over the last 30 years, human beings have become the most globalized, well-connected, well-networked we've ever been. But we've also become some of the loneliest and most isolated people we've ever been. Independence has been part of the American story from the beginning. But for most of American history, communities have been strong and deep. They've been centered around common space and common life. And when cars became more widely available and land developers starting to see, started to see efficiencies and putting homes in one place and retail in another and offices in yet another, the suburbs were born. People's work lives became dissociated from their home lives. And this idea that we would be intimately connected with our immediate community became less and less important and less and less common. And actually that physical isolation facilitated the American dream it fostered independence. So these suburbs with our big houses and our big yards became the new vision of utopia. But the problem with that was that these front porches where we used to sit and connect with our neighbors gave way to back decks with privacy fences where we could keep to ourselves. We could drive into our neighborhoods, into our driveways, into our garages and walk into our houses without ever having to talk to or even see another person. And there's another way that the American dream has started to fracture community. As we pursue success and status and independence, we forgo any allegiance to place. It's become the norm of our culture to uproot for better jobs or better schools or better lives. And each time we do that, we disconnect from the people and the place where we were. Unintentionally, the American dream has cut the heart out of the very thing that makes us most human. Deep, authentic relationship where we move towards each other in dependence. So how do we fight this? Well, I want to share a couple of things that I've learned from my neighbors over the year. First, let yourself linger. I've learned that if I just make time to be in the physical presence of people, relationship happens. Many years ago, one of my neighbors said to me, man, why are you all so, why, where are you going? Why are you always so busy? And that was really convicting to me. So now I carve out time to just sit on my porch and be a part of my neighborhood. Sometimes I'll ask neighbors to, to run an errand with me, and I found that these intentional acts foster community. Second, share things. There's a group of us who actually share a lawnmower. Now, I'll admit it's uh, not the most convenient thing. I could probably afford my own lawnmower. But what I love about it is that in sharing this lawnmower, it creates these physical handoffs, these collisions that facilitate relational connection. And that's a really good thing. Third, ask for help. I was taken aback when I first moved into Churchill. How many people ask me for things? Can I get a ride downtown? Can I borrow some eggs? Can I get some medical advice? And at first, these felt like intrusions, but over time, I came to understand them as these beautiful statements of need. My neighbors showing me that they depended on me. And it didn't take long for me to reciprocate and to start depending on them as well. You know, our culture teaches us to act like we've got it all together, 
But we all know that we don't. The act of asking for help is an act of honesty that opens the door to real relationships. So I think back to that group of college roommates all those years ago who wanted to do this together. And I realized that we had no idea what this could ever be. We, uh, we didn't have the language at the time to know that it was connection and dependence that we were looking for. And in the context of my neighborhood, as I've entered into these rich relationships with my neighbors who were, who were so different from me, yet, yet not so different from me, I've learned that dependence is essential to our humanity. It's how we were created to be. We need each other. And depending on each other is a good thing. If I've learned anything from my community over the last 10 years, it's that dependence isn't a dirty word. Thank you.